It is just after 8 a.m. We are headed on a monster road trip in a ridiculous sedan. We had to travel for a shoot. We thought, let's not fly. We'll drive these crazy cars roughly 500 miles to the shoot location and then eventually head them back. All the time, we will cover it and also kind of cross our fingers that they work. I have absolutely zero expectations of this car other than get there and get home. Paul's behind me in the Maserati. We are, we're gonna do our best. We are taking one support car with us and of course we have towing if we need it. We are road tripping the Maserati and the Volkswagen to Denver. We're starting out in Salt Lake, which is where we are right now. So we're at the very beginning of our road trip. And I'm, I'm thinking the cars are gonna do okay, to be honest. This car was road tripped, as you know, from Vegas all the way back to Salt Lake. Did great. So what is the starting status of the Phaeton? Well, it is still a 2004 Phaeton. I still bought it for $5,000, but I haven't really road tripped it. Not, not to this extent. This car has kind of been drip fed. It keeps asking for a little bit of something every single month. So right now I'm just kind of maintaining it with taking a little bit of coolant in it, a little bit of oil when it burns it off. Going into the road trip, I know I have a small coolant leak. I know I have a small oil leak. It's actually burning oil at the head gasket. I don't want to spend that money right now. Otherwise, I still can't get the steering wheel high enough to see the tops of the gauges. Anytime I do this, I see a whole part of the dashboard I've never seen. I do have a check engine light. That's because this car often thinks it's running lean. I have chased this problem a little bit and then I just stopped and said, you know what, the car runs, it actually pulls really well. I'm not going to chase that problem. It now at this point is about a $12,000 car if I count all the money I spent on it. I'm in the mode of just kind of playing the ignore the noises game with the Maserati. You've heard people drive by and you think, you might want to get that fixed on your car before it explodes. Well, I don't want to open a rat's nest of repairs and unknown bills that might, might happen if I decide to chase every noise about the car. I'm having to play the opposite of what I'm used to with this car. I usually want my cars to be running just right, perfectly. I just have to ignore the noises now and settle in. Look at that, she's hanging out, 85, almost 4,000 RPM. I'm kind of getting used to the noise in the cabin. The accessory belt is squeaking and I'm ignoring that. The hiss in the air conditioner has now gone away. She's fine. This car's fine. No problems at all, this is great. We've talked before about how these big sedans have created this low level, consistent anxiety when we drive them. And that is absolutely on display right now because I'm beginning this journey. And hopefully it'll go great. And most of the time when you get in your car and you start a road trip, I don't think you start the road trip thinking, am I gonna make it? But I absolutely am thinking that way right now to the point that I'm driving along going, Huh, is that a new rattle? Um, is that sensation weird? Did that transmission just struggle? I keep asking myself if the sensations I'm feeling are things I should be worried about, which is even worse considering I've got the better part of the entire day in the car and I'm this anxious now. At the moment, this is the perfect road trip car. Will it hold up? Am I gonna be screwed somewhere on the side of the road wishing I'd brought any other car than this $5,000 mistake? <laughs> We've turned off at Spanish Fork, just uh, south of Salt Lake, and we're taking the cutoff out to I-70 right now, and this is the road this car was built for. Long, high-speed sweepers, brilliant. This is a thirsty car, it just filled up about 20 miles ago, and it's already the needle's already moved. The stupid belt squeak is back, the problem is, when it gets hot, the squeak happens. When it got cold and it was cold all winter, I just ignored it and the belt squeak wasn't there. And now it's hot weather and so of course, the squeak is back. It's just the highest pitch, just above the engine noise and the road noise, just enough to be annoying. But I'm not, I refuse to touch it. I'm sure there's a lot of service that it will need in the future and I'm just, I'm playing the game. The wait for the noise to go away game and not investing any money in, in it, which interestingly, proliferates the problem with Maseratis. You realize this is the reason everybody who bought these cars thought, ah, I can get it cheap, I can look like a baller, I'm not gonna put any maintenance into them, and then that's why they're all suffering. In keeping with the Maserati theme, don't put money into it, just drive it and get rid of it before you have to put money into it so the next owner has the anxiety. That's what's happened to me, but I'm gonna keep the thread going. I'm gonna keep everything going. 
Now, with a car as big as this, 5,200 pounds, it's, uh, it's not exactly a corner carver. I do have the suspension in the sporty setup, which makes the dampers a little stiffer. And believe it or not, that actually does help quite a bit in this monster. It does a pretty good job. I've got Michelin Pilot AS3s on this, and actually those are pretty good tires for this big monster car. I just like being able to see mountains and actually hit corners. A road like this is better than just droning along, straight line, no scenery. This just wins. I am certain that Paul is having more fun than I am, though, in a road like this because, well, that Maserati just, it spins like a sports car compared to this thing. Sharp curves ahead. That's exactly the kind of sign that you want to see when you're driving a Quattroporte because I know I'm going to pass everybody in the corners unless I don't have a passing lane. Oh, I do have a passing lane. One mile. Sweet. See, the high-speed corners through here when it says 40 and you know you can not quite double it but still be fine, that's where this car shines. So I'm not even in sport mode yet. And that's when the skyhook suspension starts to do its thing, stiffens up just a little bit, settles the car. It's really amazing. I didn't expect the Maserati to handle this well. It's not really a sports car by any stretch. But I have a wonderful seat massager going on right now and I'm surprisingly comfortable. I don't know what that warning light was about. Okay. I'm not sure. Oh, look at the road open up here. Look at this. Some of my favorite times on shoots are when we're traveling to a shoot location and we're just on the road like this. There's nothing else to do but sit back and transport the cars, but you get to know the car, you know, the highway and freeway feel to it. You start to get to know it quite a bit and it gives you time to think. Man, look at this. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful. I love Utah and Colorado. I just love it. All right, I thought I'd have you with me for the single scariest thing I'm going to do today, and that is um, I'm going to turn on the Quattroporte. It always spins longer than I want it to. <laughs> always does. It already says go to dealer. Perfect. We have switched cars. I am now in the Phaeton, enjoying all the benefits of the Phaeton. And I'm reminded about the difference between mostly broken and potential to be broken. Between us, between the two cars, I think we have one good car. One car that everything is working and is fine and no anxiety whatsoever. That's not the case here. But all the stuff that the Phaeton is really good at, this is really bad at and vice versa. The Phaeton starts every time. I never think twice about it. I just get in, fire it up, off it goes. It might not run like it's supposed to. This might not start. And then once it starts, it's still kind of horrifying until you actually get rolling and then it feels okay until you find a corner and then it feels great. We give a lot of advice on our show, even more on the podcast. I can't recommend the complete paranoia that comes along with buying a $10,000 early Maserati Quattroporte. For those of you that are saying she should have just bought the one with the good ZF8 speed, they aren't $10,000. The upper limit of what we were doing when we bought these old, rickety, ridiculous sedans was $10,000 was the cap. And I was chasing for a five or $6,000 Phaeton. I found one for five grand that has worked pretty well, actually. The only Maserati Quattroportes that were available for anywhere around 10 grand were like this with the F1 transmission that is a constant source of anxiety. I do love the road trip nature of this car. It is one of the better road trip cars ever conceived by man. You don't think of the American car market as the continent you want to cross in a car. You get in an airplane. Whereas Europe is very different, and I think that's why this car never caught on, because crossing the continent in this, it's a long way, but it can. It's almost better suited for North America than it is for Europe, because this is the car I'd rather be in. You just enjoy it so much more and on a road trip you don't need something that handles well you don't it just needs to be so comfortable and your rear end needs to feel like it's still attached to your body when you get to your destination this is such the opposite experience of the phaeton and, I, and i've said it before and i stand by it paul and i bought the opposite sedans for our proclivities. Paul is genuinely much more concerned with luxury and appointments and ride and these kind of things. He should have bought the Phaeton. I'm genuinely much more concerned with handling above all else. I probably should have bought the Quattroporte. And these are parts of the reason why I think this is brilliant. Why I'm so glad we didn't buy the obvious choices. <laughs> Here we are. I thought Todd would hate this car. I honestly did. This is the opposite of a Lotus. This is the opposite of lightweight sports cars. And for that reason, I thought he would hate it. I know that you like the cocoon part of it, but other than that, I thought he would just be 
bored and he loves it. On the other hand, I am kind of bored, even though it's got good power and 80 is an irrelevant number. I'm, I'm bored by the motion of the scenery. It's so capable. The Phaeton always surprises me that it's so composed in corners. This feels delicate in corners. It feels like a sports car. There's a lightness here, an athleticism that I think is unexpected by most of us when we look at these cars from afar. We think it sounds good, it's gonna be a money pit, but the drive itself is really rewarding. I forgot that the steering wheel does not move up and down. That motor is broken. It will move in and out, it'll telescope, but up and down is done. So I, I'm, you know, the, the wheel is almost in my lap way down here which is fine because the seats make up for it. The seats are great and actually they're better than the Maseratis because the Maserati still used rotary dials on the seats for the massage functions. The problem with the massage functions on the Quattroporte is that they're very intermittent and you'll forget that they're on. And so every so often you'll feel like some sort of animal is in a sack under your, your rear end and you're going, wait, oh right, I turned on the massage function. Not so on the Phaeton. It just works, it's brilliant. And yes, there are many benefits on the road trip like this. This is your own little airplane seat. I've had the opportunity to sit in first class seats and when you sit in a first class seat in an airplane, you don't get a tire pressure monitoring system fault that just comes on randomly to scare you. I'm sure everything's fine, but ah, uh, again, with the mostly broken and the potential to be broken, that's, that's the difference. At the mostly broken phase, like the Phaeton is, you just accept it. Fortunately, none of the things that are broken are affecting the road trip experience. This is actually the farthest I've ever driven the Quattroporte, and I have to say that the Phaeton is more comfortable. It, the driving position, no matter what I do with the seat, it's better in the Phaeton. The seats are actually a little bit better as well, even though these have a little more bolstering. They, they feel like they'd be better on a back road, but just for sawing through the miles, I do prefer the seats in the Phaeton, in spite of the fact that they're older and more broken down. Unlike Paul, I don't know what's broken in this car, so every time I touch a button, I just go, am I making it worse? I don't entirely know, but so far it's holding up fine. Ah, uh, yeah, that mirror droops a little bit. Oh, yeah, I don't want to move it because I don't want something to come off in my hand. This Quattroporte has half the mileage of my Phaeton. This doesn't feel like it has half the mileage. It feels like it has, you know, like 100,000 or 120. It feels like it's got a lot. Between these two cars, these came out in 04 and 05, so pretty much the same era. And that is all the little things that are broken and are not. To be honest, the Volkswagen doesn't feel as well built as the Maserati. And you'd expect at $90,000, this car should be exquisitely machined. All the buttons should be amazing to feel. And they're just plastic Volkswagen buttons from 2004. Whereas the Maserati feels entirely different. I don't even know what this sticky button on the side of the seat does. Anytime you find sticky buttons in a car from the early 2000s, it just kind of makes you cringe. It's like nails on a chalkboard because you're not sure how that's going to end. Is the button going to stick full time? Are pieces of it going to come off in my hand? These are all possibilities. See, like this. This is not okay. When you think you paid only $5,000 or $10,000 for one of these, you can accept that. But new? No way. But ultimately, I'm impressed for these two, the way they've been treated and kind of mistreated. I'm impressed the way these two cars are holding up. What I love about the Phaeton is the ambient air conditioning. You don't really feel it blowing on you unless it's super hot and you direct a vent at you. It's just this you know, ambient temperature at all times swirling around you. It's pretty great. This air conditioner cannot keep up. It is trying. It has dedicated itself to the process. It is cranked. <laughs> the dash says it's trying to get to 59. And the air coming out is cool, but we're not gonna get anywhere close. My guess is we're running about 75 in here. It's just this side of hot enough to sweat. I think both of us driving these cars as much as we have, have been the best thing we could have been doing for them, honestly. Cars don't like to sit. And these two are proof of that. These cars are just happy now that they're getting beat on a little bit. They're running well. But look at that, doesn't it look exotic? You're following behind that thing, what is that? Are you honestly gonna tell me you'll think that's 15 years old? Doubtful? You're gonna think, ah, that's a cool new exotic car, it must cost you what, 11 grand, 11 five? There she is, the big beautiful monster that is the Phaeton. I think that car looks good on the move. It also looks just Teutonic, it looks like don't bother me, I'm driving. 
Yeah, look at that Maserati in the rearview mirror. Looking tight. It almost looks like a Jag XK. That tumble home makes it look like an exotic car. The way the windows lean in. Look at this road, by the way. Have you seen, look at this road. This is crazy. And when we wind up on I-70, it's still gonna be gorgeous. It's like you're sitting in a lounge and these are all TV screens with scenery around you. It just doesn't seem real because you're so isolated. Noise, the size of the car, you're completely isolated. It's like you're in the diorama just observing the museum. Update on the Maserati. Let's see, it has an intermittent tail light out. When you actually drive behind this car, it's out pretty much all the time. The one on the right is out. In here, the car knows every now and then that it's out. And its answer is, please see dealer. Because that's the problem with these crazy, ridiculous luxury cars, is that they don't want you to worry about anything in a normal fashion. Hey, the brake lights are working. So everything appears to be working in the Maserati. Now, the air conditioning is still not everything we'd like it to be. The tail light is going out now and then and recommending you see dealer. There are no check engine lights going on on this car. I can't say the same for the Phaeton. See, if I do this, I see the warning lights, which I don't want to, so I'll sit up higher. Okay, so mostly broken car has had stuff done to it. The suspension has been replaced up front. Two new batteries. The coolant leak hasn't really been solved, but it has had an oil change. This is a testament. It's got 135, almost 136,000 miles. It feels like it'll go to 300, no problem. You drive it, you take care of this. Can you imagine Phaetons if they were taken care of? And unlike my Maserati, which people only bought for flash and never took care of, I do think many people took care of their Phaetons, but the engineering overcame a lot of the maintenance issues that you hear about. Okay, all right, give me my passing lane. Let's unleash the Italian here. I'd say it's time for a daily triple. Give those two a second. You know, give the Phaeton just a second to pick up speed and get serious. And the acceleration is just a whoosh. Now we're going. It's just so easy. It's just so easy. That pulls all the way to red line. <whistles> Daily triple. Easy. No problem. <laughs> the Phaeton is an immovable object. Knowing the speed we're going, I know that Paul is barely awake in there. <sighs> all right. Ooh, she's fast. Yeah, that is a number I shouldn't be doing and I'm bored. Anything under 100 in the Phaeton is boring. That's a, that's a big number. I'm not sure Paul's done that in this car. That is a big number. And Todd's gonna explore the upper limits of Daily Triple. <clears throat> See, look how good that looks. Oh, come on, that's what she's built for. Yeah, woo, smells like Maserati. This may sound strange, but when you drive the Phaeton and the Maserati, what I come away with is I know which country has the Autobahn. Because at high speed in the Maserati, it's, it's a little darty, it's quite a bit noisier. It feels like it's happy to do this, but it'd rather be on a road with more corners. Whereas the Phaeton, the flatter and straighter it gets, the more it just says, put your foot to the floor, I don't care. You're being active in the Maserati and you're almost passive in the Phaeton. What's crazy is you don't feel disconnected in the Phaeton, but it asks very little of you. Here you're connected and it's asking a lot all the time. I'm speaking comparatively, you understand. This isn't a car that is the least bit tiring. You get in a dedicated sports car, it feels far more involving and difficult and sacrificial on a road like this than this Maserati does. This feels like a luxury car compared to most things most people have driven. But compared to the Phaeton, the Phaeton is the better just mild chewing luxury car. Maserati was probably planning for you to take a coastal road to your villa. And Volkswagen was planning for you to take the Autobahn until you hit a country border. A long on-ramp. This is great. Hey, look, a corner. I should be scared. Comfortably numb. Volkswagen Phaeton. Comfortably numb. I'm back in here after driving the Maserati and I'm just thinking, yeah, this is where I want to be. For this, this is the car. And I'm having trouble honestly thinking about how good this must have felt when it was brand new and how I don't think anything in the modern time, new for new, I don't think this has been surpassed. We've been swapping cars all day long, in and out, back and forth, and coming to the conclusions about would we own these cars? I mean, long term. I'm surprised again 
thinking about all the cars I've ever road tripped in, all of the big sedans we've driven. Even recently, we drove the S-Class, we drove the A8, we drove the 7 Series. And the thing I'm shocked by is this car feels older than those sedans. It feels more tired than the new big boy sedans. But it doesn't feel worse. In fact, to put it another way, why don't those big sedans feel better than this? Why haven't we moved on? I, I'm sticking with Maserati. I would choose this car. And funny enough, as great as the Phaeton is, I still like my Maserati. I would choose this one. It feels like home. It's the weirdest feeling. It takes me almost a year to live with a car for it to become mine and you know really get to know its quirks and how it drives and that's what this car is doing it's just working its way into becoming mine only to shortly leave and that's a weird feeling i like it a lot but i can't stand the anxiety this was a ridiculous car in its time it was a stupid investment when volkswagen did it this car makes no sense and yet i don't know that i've driven a better road car this one feels well old a bit a bit beat on kind of run down but it's got 135,000 miles it should it deserves to but this air suspension i'm running along in normal mode i also could put it in comfort mode and get even more casual this is one of those cars that when you settle into on cruise control a pretty fast speed and 10 minutes later you go shouldn't i be going faster shouldn't we crank this up 10 or 20 or 30 miles an hour and then you look at your speedo and go can't do that already pushing the limits I get the sense the car might be a bit bored. I get the idea that because it was built for the Autobahn, it's rather than like 90-ish, it'd like me to be going, I don't know, about 160, which I would like that too. But I feel like this is kind of the upper level of what's, you know, you can see legal from here. By the way, yes, I'm still running the seat massager because every time it turns off, I just hit the button again because why did we stop? Putting a ton of miles on this car makes me believe in it more. I mean, I've never been more than about 50 to 100 miles from my house at any time in this car. So to be at this point nearly 500 miles from home and this thing just runs. I mean, yes, it still says check engine light every now and then the TPMS still goes nuts. I'm sure I'm still leaking things. None of the problems have fixed themselves, but they've also revealed themselves to not be nearly as bad as I would like to be afraid of. And you know my love for Maserati has been nurtured and grown and developed by this car. I'm not sure I would buy it just for the anxiety alone, but I've come to the realization that I love the dynamics of what Maserati created in the QP5. This is the elegant style. Everybody who drives this car is so impressed. Everybody is a convert. As soon as I let them drive this car, everybody converts. They think, well, yeah, you're not just, you know, talking out of your nose. You're, you actually are onto something here. Actually, I don't know if I should say this, but, but Paul's a little offended because everybody likes to drive this the most on a road trip. He kind of wants everybody to like the Maserati, and the Maserati is crazy fun and runs in spite of whatever you've heard. However, for sawing through miles, for just, I have another 300 miles to go, you want to be here, you just do. So the answer is LS swap the Maserati and then everybody's happy and, uh, you know, you lose the Ferrari engine, but I, I love the dynamics. Unfortunately, it seems like most of the driving most of us do these days is commuting, which is the worst thing that happens to driving. We dream about amazing mountain roads. We do everything we can to show you guys really beautiful roads with these cars. But there's something magical about a road trip. Yes, you have moments when it's just mind numbing, but go with people that you like. You'll end up talking about stuff you never imagined. If you can take a road trip and you have more than one car, swap vehicles. Just to give you a different sensory experience of driving something different. We've done that this entire trip. It's been great. I love being out here. Clears the mind. You feel refreshed. Everything is just set right on road trips. It almost doesn't matter the cars that you have, but you've got these two proving that you can take 15, 16 year old cars on the road trip, not be afraid. No matter how good your road trip car is, and it may be your boring minivan or your commuter Prius or some great sports car, it doesn't matter. Seeing new scenery you've never seen before go past you out the window, there's something invigorating about that, and we can't encourage it enough. In fact, I'll be honest, I don't think of it often enough. And I know it sounds weird, but seeing new things kind of resets your perspective on the stuff you see every day. I just knew deep down this car would be great on the road trip. 
And the funny thing is, the joke has kind of been on us and everybody else too, because who would have thought these two cheap cars that kind of added up to about fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 together have been amazing. This car is absolutely loving the road trip. It's quieted down even more, it's smoothed out even more. <laughs> My confidence grows. My love for Maserati grows. I can't believe how much I like this car. Driving this Phaeton and having it do this well on this trip and be kind of the standout of the adventure, to be honest with you, has given me an extra confidence in it that it just, it wants to run. I mean, it's gonna ask me for something else next month to, uh, to feed it, but at the same time, it's not asking me for anything major and nothing catastrophic is warning me so far. Reliable old Maserati. Who knew? And after a thousand miles, nothing broke. Well, nothing new broke. We got so confident, we even recorded a podcast while driving. And in the end, these cars just made us want to road trip more. Our time with these big sedans is almost done. We'll be giving them away soon to our audience. But before we do, we're going for top speed. Be sure you're subscribed.